Mexico. <laughs> Church, I'm feeling good this morning. How you feeling? You know, I miss this service. I miss this service, because this service and Pastor David gives me the strength I need. We know, you know, we used to call it church, the filling station, you know? Get filled up so you can go far out there. So this is good. I, 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 I am appreciative this morning. Good to see you, Reverend. I, I thank you. Yeah. You got a little tan. You got a little tan. You got, you got a little tan. I stood in my bedroom this morning, church, and tears began to come to my eyes. Not because I was sad, but because I feel so good. And I said, you don't feel good because you ate a good meal. Your wife kissed you last night. You don't feel good because your clothes fit and your shoes are shine. You feel good because God said, I love you, Gerald Davis. I love you so much, I'm blessing you every second you take a breath. So when you realize the blessings, you start feeling thankful. And of course, tears will come when you are thankful. Well, church, I want to speak to you this morning because up above my head, I hear music in the air. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere up above my head. Above my head, I see trouble in the air. See trouble in the air. Up above my head, I see trouble in the air. Up above my head, above my head. I see trouble in the air. But there must be a God somewhere. Now I'm singing this song because uh, there is trouble in the air. There's music in the air. So we don't say there's no trouble, I only want to hear the music. And we don't say, oh, I see trouble and we don't hear the music. We got to have them both. So I want to speak to you this morning about why it's important to hear the music but see trouble. Come on. All right, I'm going to talk to you because I can sing like a song. No, I ain't going to sing. I'm going to sing. All right, here we go. You all know that my wife and I took a pleasant trip to Jamaica. All right. And of course, all the good things happen. You know, the beautiful water, the beautiful food, beautiful people, the graciousness, make you feel like you are somebody. But before all of that transpired, we flew in, made our way through customs beautifully, had a little snack because the folks are gracious, and we got on a van to take us to our hotel slash resort. As we sat on the hotel, I mean on, in the van, my wife and I talked, chit-chatted, we were excited, and then the driver got on the van and started it up, and the driver said, welcome to Jamaica. 
let me tell you about Jamaica. And the brother began to talk about a, that people say Christopher Columbus discovered this. And that. He said, how can this man discover something that's already here? And he began to extol the experiences he had had trying to tell people that what you read is not always true. And he gave all of us a lesson, a little history lesson about Jamaica and Christopher Columbus. And he used some colorful language. <laughs> and, and I looked at my wife, you know, I said, ooh. <laughs> And I began to talk with him, you know. I'm not going to let this go by without saying, you right, brother, go on. <laughs> Tell us some more. What else? So he gave us even more of a lesson about Jamaica. He talked about the cars. He said, you see all these Toyotas out here? He said, in Japan, they took old used cars and put them in the ocean so that they would be used as a reef. He said an enterprising Jamaican saw all this and said, wait a minute, man. You need to talk to us, our country. He said, so now they have a relationship with Japan where the Toyotas, the used Toyotas are sent to Jamaica and people buy them and they know how to fix them up and you have Toyotas everywhere. I said, okay, brother, I got you. He said, no, you don't, you don't let good things go to the bottom of the sea. You're able to retrieve. Right? So I began to say, okay, talk to us more. I mean, I'm, I was really in a conversation with him. Right? The rest of the van was falling silent. We stopped at a place that I'm sure he wanted us to spend some money there. He, he said, I know this is not on your itinerary, but let's, we're going to have a quick stop. Go in there and get some cheap beer. <laughs> you know? And the folks would come going off, go to Joe and I stayed on the, on the van. And this one woman walked by and said, why don't he just shut up and get us there? But the brother had more to say. He said, you see these nice houses here? He said, these are Jamaicans who live there. Let you know that, wait a minute, you know, you may be tourists thinking that, you know, that this island was made for us. The tourists, no. He was saying that's not how it is. And the brother went on to give us a whole lot of good information that was true, but you didn't read about it. Now that set the tone for me, church, because I then began to not only accept the graciousness that I was given, the hospitality, but I inquired a little deeper to find out a little bit more. So the young lady who was so gracious to us at the airport who ushered us through customs after I began to inquire a little deeper, she went on and spoke to me about her life and how she is in college at the University of West Indies and she wants to work and make money. But her mother says, no child, you finished school. Your brother stopped because he wanted to work and make money and he never went back. You will not do that. You go to school. And I said to her, your mama's right. You got to keep on. I know this little change feels good, but you need to go on and complete your undergraduate degree. I went a little bit further in talking to the people and got a lot better understanding because people are people. And especially we who have felt oppression. Which brings us to why I see trouble in the air. If we don't go past the, the veneer and flattery and graciousness and talk to people, then trouble will build and build until there is an explosion. I think it's important in this church that we understand the need to go past just the how you doings and go into what you're doing and find out about how the lives of folks are being led all around us, this church, which says love is beyond belief. We love beyond belief. This church, which says we're a church of one faith, many expressions. This church needs to be a leader on this front and speak to one another deeper than where we are and ask what's going on, really what's going on. I spent the past week, church, 
at the Summer Institute that the Southern region where, of which we are a part puts on each year. And this institute is called The Point. It's located at Sequoia State Park. I went there and my wife was just going to drive me up and go back home, but it got so good she stayed, you know? And that's, that's the way it is when things are going good. You hear music in there, you know? But you know, at that, at the, 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 the point had a theme, and the theme was building a new land, right? Building a new land, not, not being satisfied with what we have, but let's go build something better. And the way that you build something better, this the point said, we are Unitarian Universalists and we have made a decision. And that decision is we will dismantle white supremacy. We will undo racism. This denomination said that not the Baptists, not the Methodists, not the Episcopal Paleons, not the, oh, none of them said we are going to do this out loud they said it. So that was the theme and I was uh, co-leading a workshop and Yadani also was part of that workshop on building an anti-racist, anti-oppressive church. And so uh, along with Chuck Freeman, the three of us had this workshop going on. The first night that you were there, they have a tradition where all the ministers are assembled in front. And you introduce yourself, say where you're serving, and then you speak about your own theology and what you are wrestling with. And so I did my usual thing and told the truth. And it went on down at the end of the line. And finally they turned and said, okay, are there any questions from the folks who are here? And the people who are here are you, the members of UU congregations all over the southern region and particularly Texas and Arkansas, and Missouri and Oklahoma. And so one of the questions came out, you know, a friend of mine said that this dismantling white supremacy was just a little bit too harsh to say those words. Don't you think it would be, you know, you're hurting yourself if you say dismantle white supremacy? The microphone was down there. I jumped over three, four people. Give me that mic. I said, let me tell you real quick, no. We gotta say the words, church. You gotta say what is bothering us. We gotta say it. We cannot, oh no longer, church, not at this time in our history. Shrunk back from being real. That bus driver driving us to a pleasurable time told the truth. He wanted all of us to know that there's trouble in the air if you don't see it. Right. He's got to let you know about it. So I said, no, we got to talk about white supremacy. And I went on and on and talk about it. And then the, the young lady next to me, also a minister, said, you know, what you're saying, sir, is that your white feelings get hurt. Do you know that white feelings are better than black bodies? Is that what you're saying? You know, white feelings are, must be guarded. Never mind that the black bodies are being killed, locked up, and thrown away. You see, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with understanding. It's not about you personally is a white supremacist. It's about we are in the water of white supremacy. It's time to dump this water, y'all. You know what water looks like and smells like when you don't change it? It's not good, church. No, nothing's going, nothing good's going to grow out of that kind of water. That's swampy water. We need to throw that water out, put some clean living water in there so that we can all become better people together. And so you don't shirk away. You don't shrink away. You don't do the same things that were done before, which is to ignore or to say, if you just be like us, we'll all get along. Just, 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 just be like us, you know? All you got to do, sing the song, say the words, speak eloquently, pronounce every syllable, 
you know, I, I went to school. I know how to do that. But you know, sometimes I just let it go. You know, sometimes I don't say, I don't complete my words. Sometimes my wife has to say, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs> She has to remind me, you know, because I, sometimes I just let it go. I don't want to be so eloquent. Right. I just want to tell it. Yes. So that but, that, but that, but that is part of the water that we have, we are living in because we are told if you do these things, then you'll be heard. Yes. Then you'll be accepted. But that's a lie. It always has been a lie. But now it's time to call it a lie. You know, we're talking this this, this uh, month about independence. And I told Brother Marlin that I, I'd hit on this a little bit because we have these people we, we lift up as founders of this nation and we extol their virtues. And they did do a thing, they did. But that's not the whole story, church. We, we, need, we never need to just say these were exceptional folk and we just bow down at who they are because they were not. They were slaveholders as well. They lied. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and he didn't mean me in there. He had no business thinking that people would think that that meant me. No, he didn't have that in his mind. He, he wrote that with no consideration that I was a fully alive, functioning human being who needed to be part of a Declaration of Independence. Now, do I therefore say I can't stand Thomas Jefferson because he left me out? No, but now I say I know Thomas Jefferson and why he left me out. I say that. Because we don't talk about Sally Hemings, do we? Now, we don't say nothing about Sally Hemings. But you know Sally Hemings was part of the Thomas Jefferson duplicity. Yes. You see, that was part of the whole thing. Thomas Jefferson, this is what he said. He actually wrote this, talking about black people and being enslaved and what do we do about slavery. He said, it is like you have your hands around the ears of a wolf. If you let the wolf go, he might eat you. But you can't hold a wolf like this for long. So what do you do? So he came, he said, oh, it's bad to have slavery. But he also said, come here, Sally. Yeah, and then he would go back and forth around, I know it's bad, but it sure is good. <laughs> you know, Thomas Jefferson built his home, Monticello, and equipped it, the dining room, with a dumb waiter so that the people would never see the black folks serving the food. The food was down in the basement. And they would put the food on the basement and his wife would trundle over the dumb waiter, take the food out and put it on the table. And you never saw the black folks cooking, you never saw the black folks serving. He didn't want that, that was an embarrassment. Thomas Jefferson did that. Thomas Jefferson said, the issue of these black folks, you know, you got justice in one hand on the scale, but you gotta have self-preservation over here. He was afraid to say I'm against slavery because slavery to Thomas Jefferson meant money. It was all about the money. When the man died, he called his house staff all around his bed, including the Hemings, the ones who were fathered by him. He called them all around his bed on July the 4th, 1826, the same day that John Adams died. They both died on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, 1776, July 4th, 1826. Call him all around his bed. And we don't know exactly what he said, but you know they remain in slavery. See, that's the thing, he didn't release them because he knew this. The experts say the amount of money that he owed at the time of his death was equal to what we would call $1.2 million. He owed a lot of money and he needed those black folks to continue to pick that cotton or tobacco. He needed that. Now, I don't say, therefore, I don't believe in what Thomas Jefferson wrote. I just know what Thomas Jefferson was. And that's the thing, to tell the whole story. So the point that I attended did that. The person who led our theme speeches 
the Reverend Deanna Vandiver from New Orleans spoke it. She told it the way it is. She said, you know, folks, she said, I'm white and, you know, I came to New Orleans and I did all the thing. I went to school, did all the good stuff I was supposed to do, found myself working for an organization that made me the executive director. Meanwhile, this African-American woman, older than I was, an elder, had come to help out at a social service agency and worked in the kitchen. And she did such a marvelous job organizing and everything. She said, well, you need to come by and, and, and work with us again. She said, surely. And by the way, let me give you my resume. And she sent the resume and she looked at this resume. And this woman was bad. She had all this organizing experience and, and, and uh, uh, Reverend Vandiver only knew her working in the kitchen, right? So she called her up and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's, 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 let's do this and hired her as the office manager. Well, executive director and office manager, they, they worked along side by side and she started realizing this woman knows more than I do. And she said, time out. We don't need to keep this charade up. Let's be co-directors because you know what needs to be done. And the black woman said, well, let's do that. And since they have done that, they have worked beautifully. Now, she has experience in telling the truth about herself. Folks kept telling her, you need to go to the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. This is a group in New Orleans that has been working tirelessly, dismantling racism, uh, opposing white supremacy and teaching people how to do it. And so she said, okay, I'll get there, I'll get there. When she finally did, she said, everything just came clear. She began to understand the structures that we're in. It's a reason why it is. It's a reason. And these, these are the things that we need to do as a congregation. Start educating ourselves. And yes, we can do that in love. You don't come back after you're educated and say, I hate. No, you just say, I've been duped. That's what it is. We have been told not to dig deeper, not to try to find out what's going on. When you start doing that, you can't help yourself. You want to read more, like the book, Stamped from the Beginning. Come on. Stamped from the Beginning, from Ibram X. Kende. Now, Ibram X. Kende wrote this book. He's an historian bad brother, wrote this book to let us know the real deal about this thing that we're swimming in. He says, most of us, church, think that this craziness comes from ignorance and hatred. And the ignorance and hatred breeds racist ideas, and these racist ideas lead to discrimination. But Dr. Kendi says, actually, it's the opposite. You see, everything that comes from discrimination comes out of political, economic, or cultural self-interest. See, I want it, I take it, and then I come up with racist ideas in order to substantiate my taking it, right? And then the racist ideas then lead to the hatred and the ignorance because people start thinking about the racist ideas that is not that are not true but they start living it like that so you know thomas jefferson played that card all of them play that card which is to say well you know these black folks are, are good you know but they can't handle things on their own you know they did they descended from from another group of uh uh, animals out there. They, they're not really human beings. They came out of, and this is true. This is what high high was back then. This is how they set it up. A racist idea. The whole idea of, of, of black folks being mad at each other and based on color consciousness. That was a racist idea that said, well, if we're more white, if we act more white, if you look more white, maybe they'll accept us. And that racist idea led to a whole bunch of unnecessary madness between us based on color. Racist ideas. Racist ideas are the things that we're trying to dismantle. The racist ideas are so inculcated in this culture, we just go around, we don't even you know, recognize them anymore. We just go on. We just keep going, even though it's a racist idea. And if you responded to everything, you'd probably have a heart attack, drop dead. 
So I understand that. We can't. But you got to know what's going on. You got to know it's a racist idea that is fueling what it is that's inside of you that's making you angry. A racist idea. So Kende wants us to get back to what, go look at what is the self-interest. Who benefits? You start looking at who is it that benefits. Once you understand who benefits, then you say, okay, that's why there's a discrimination. It's a reason why there's segregation in America, even after the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments and all of that stuff. We understand why segregation was instituted, because they never want us to be through or talking to one another and be able to understand one another. Right? Thomas Jefferson, once again, Thomas Jefferson was the person who brought that Louisiana Purchase in 1803, right? All of that, all that land that came from Louisiana Purchase that was like three cents an acre when it came out. France paid for that. But you know what Thomas Jefferson was thinking? He said, well, if you throw all the black people out there, they'll just kind of get lost. We won't have to worry about them no more. Right? He was thinking like that. Just move all these back, and sure enough, black folks got moved out there, but unfortunately, they were enslaved. And that's why you got sugarcane in Louisiana and in East Texas. That's why you got all that stuff going to, you know, cotton, all of that. And that was hard labor, hard labor. Through the Louisiana Purchase, they said, let's go out west and, and do the same thing we were doing on the East Coast. All right, so when you understand these things, church, you begin to say, okay, I get it. I'm awake. Now what? And that's where we got to come back to the faith. Because, you know, those folks that went before us, that still uh, worked hard, but they understood that, you know, this is not just the way it's supposed to be. You know, that song that said, I got my, eye, my, uh, my hand on the plow. Got my hand on the plow. That's the same song that said, I got the eyes on the prize. Hand on the plow, but eyes on the prize. So church, that's where we are. We, when we are awake, we can't just drop out and say, I'm tired of this, they, they fooled me for all these years, I'm done. No, we work to dismantle it because we want more and more people, white and black people, to understand their participation in this thing called white supremacy. We are not afraid to talk about that because that's what it is. It is based upon a racist idea that white people are superior to people of color. That's the bottom line. It's a racist idea. It is not true. It is not true, and we cannot give that up. You are made in the image of God. God didn't say, I'm looking past black people and only awarding these folks. I don't care if they are Unitarians, you know? You know, God said, I ain't looking past you, right? So here's the deal, church. When we're in this spot together and we're becoming more and more human and we're looking at each other more and more like that, that means that we are, we have become a threat. Now, this white supremacy didn't last this long without having weapons. Now, the threats come with all kinds of, of uh, baggage, you know, intimidation, threats, all kinds of things to say, get back in your place, and in in, in some not so subtle ways. Lot, mass incarceration, all of these things are geared for us to be quiet. But that's what I think God says, uh, you, you, that's not what I want you to do. See, I believe that, you, you know, when that song that Aretha sings, Oh Mary, don't you weep, yeah. Martha, don't you moan. And the reason why is Pharaoh's army got drowned. And you say, okay, how are these two together? Mary and Martha are weeping because Lazarus, their brother died. And Jesus wasn't there to raise him up. And so they are hurt and in pain. And so Retha tells the story. She said, Jesus said, well, well, where is Lazarus? Where is you laying? And they pointed to where he was. And Jesus went and three times said, Lazarus. And you know how Retha goes. Retha leans back, Lazarus. And Lazarus rose up and started walking around like a natural man. Right? So then here's the point of why you say Pharaoh's army. Jesus and God brought the Israelites who were the oppressed out of bondage into Canaan. 
No one thought that possible. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. No one thought that possible. I'm not being literal here. I'm trying to show you symbolism. In the impossible, there is a way. When you began to feel like I know what's going on, I don't know what to do, that's only the first step. You know what's going on. God wants us to get busy. You know, it's always, always going to be action and movement with God. God is not, God is not happy with us just saying, as, as Dorothy said, God's not just happy with us praising God. God says, you know, you need to help one another. You need to urge one another to get to that place where they began to understand that I haven't left you. I love you. I have not left you. And praise is thankfulness. But then God says, thank you. I, I hear you. You're welcome. Now, take that energy and move. Make this place a better place because that's what I really want. I want the peaceable realm. That's the kingdom of God. The peaceable realm. I want that. That's what God is telling us. But you can't have peace if you don't have justice. You got to work and you got to tell the truth. You got to do what you know God wants us to do, which may not be popular with the folks who want to keep us in the dirty water. But it's still something we got to do. We got to move on. Now, I'm not telling you to cuss out the next policeman you see. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling you to take up arms. I remember a brother told me when the, when the uh, unfortunate killing of the young man, Joshua Berry, occurred up in North Tulsa, and people came because they were hurt. And they assembled because they were hurt. And suddenly before them was this array of armed law enforcement facing the crowd as if the crowd was the problem. The crowd was just there. They were just, they didn't know what to do except get there and just mourn. That's what they were doing, mourning. But this one brother saw the police and he said, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. And he took off his shirt. You know, you're getting ready to fight, you know. You can't grab hold of a shirt if you don't have one on. He took off his shirt like that's going to help him with a mass of armed law enforcement. And he started walking to take on the law enforcement. And another brother grabbed him and said, man, this is suicide. You can't do that. That's not what we need to do. We need to be organized. You can't sacrifice your body in the face of that. So I'm not saying to go off on your own. I'm saying turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to organize because that's what they're afraid of. If we continue to be separate, we're winning, they say. But once we organize, ooh, scary. That's how we return the threats, the intimidation, the attack. We organize. So you're not by yourself. You're with someone else who knows where you are because you're both in the same game of dismantling this water, pouring it out. So you don't have to explain it all because they're right there with you. That's my hope for this church, that we are together and we're moving in the same direction, praising God as we go. The folks in the civil rights movement knew it. That's what they were doing. They were saying, I ain't going to let segregation turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I'm going to let segregation turn me around. I'm going to keep on walking keep on the talking. That's what we need to do. We're not going to, we're not just going to give up. And we're not just going to sit down and say, I'm, I'm just not able. Because we are together. So church, three things. Read, read, read. Because once you read the rest, it, it, it turn you loose. Read that book. Read that book, stamp from the beginning. The title comes from Jefferson Davis. You know, that was the president of the Confederacy. But before then, he was a US Senator from Virginia. And Jefferson Davis on the Senate floor rose to speak against legislation that would have helped black people get educated at schools. And he rose to say, ain't no use doing that. Don't try to educate the black person in any way. They can't be educated. They were stamped from the beginning. That's what Jefferson Davis said on the US Senate floor. And brother Kinde, Dr. Kinde wrote his book, 
a history about racist ideas. He wrote that book and called it Stamp from the Beginning because that's what we're dealing with, racist ideas. You start there, read. Not only just read Kendi's book, but keep reading. Read The Half Has Never Been Told, which tells you all about slavery. Tells you about Edward E. Baptist, who said he wanted to find out from the, from the people who were ex-enslaved uh, ex, uh, people. And so he went to Washington where there are warehouses full of, of, of first-person narratives of enslaved people. This came about because Franklin Roosevelt in the 40s during the, during the Depression, where well, the 30s during the Depression, sent out writers and gave them jobs to interview formerly enslaved people to get their first-person accounts. They did. They wrote them down beautifully. And then the manuscripts were put in warehouses. Some of them were published. Bullwhip Days is, is a book that's out there. That's about that. But most of them were not. They're just in a warehouse. Edward Baptist, historian, white, PhD, did his research. He went there and read. He read about what it was like to be enslaved. He went to New Orleans where they still have the records, where they sold people and got the records and, and hooked up the records with the narratives that he had read. He got all of this together and then he wrote this book, The Half Has Never Been Told. Read that book, but don't just stop there, keep reading because you're gonna find out more and more and more and when you read, then your feet gonna start moving. Because you know that order my steps? You know, you pray that, pray order my steps and you watch what happens. God says, I want you talking here and then go here and the next thing you know, you organize. You're with folks who love you. Church, that's my message today. That we have music in the air because we are that kind of folks who understand that the sun is rising every day. It's not going to stop. The sun keeps rising, which gives you another opportunity. So there's music in the air because we are optimistic. We think possibility. We love the Lord and the Lord loves us. That's who we are. That's why we're here in this place. But there's also trouble in the air. And we can't just hide our faces. We have to look at the trouble and face it. God knows that we can. I know that you can. And we will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. You're my brother. You're my sister. So take me by the hand. Together we will work till we're done. You're visiting with us online today. We love connecting with people all across the country and around the world sharing our powerful message of love beyond belief. There's something new happening here. You can now join All Souls as a virtual member. Our virtual membership is designed for friends who live outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma and who want to engage with All Souls in a meaningful way. You can be part of an expanding family, a global family really, wherever you are. If you live in Oklahoma, Ohio, or Orange County, California, Canada, or Cameroon. By becoming a virtual member, you'll be able to deepen your connections with members and friends here in Tulsa and with members wherever you are. Each week, you'll receive special All Souls content tailored for you, our virtual members. Virtual members have access to pastoral care, to personal prayers, and also receive invitations to exclusive web events. You can learn more, and if you're ready, you can become a virtual member today by visiting allsoulschurch.org forward slash virtual membership. We're grateful our ministries are having a positive impact on your life, and we want to share the good news of Love Beyond Belief with more and more people. So no matter what, we need your support to keep this ministry growing and thriving, so please consider making a gift today. You can do so by texting Love BB for Love Beyond Belief to 73256 or simply visit our website. You are a blessing in our lives. May you be blessed. And be a blessing.